phases of the compiler are, and then we look at the front end phases first, and we look at lexical analyzer, syntax analyzer, and semantic analyzer, and what we are doing by end of this process was capturing the meaning of the program, and we were able to get a unique meaning of the program, which everyone is going to interpret in the same manner. And then we looked at certain optimizations, and once we looked at optimization, we were removing dependencies from the program without worrying about what the underlying algorithm was. Then we started looking at the translation of the abstract syntax tree, which was disambiguated already by the semantic analyzer phase, into something which is closer to machine, and we looked at abstractions which are available to us at the source level versus abstractions at the target level, and then we were looking at how to convert now these abstractions into the machine abstractions, right? And we said that the process is going to be that all the identifiers, they are going to be mapped into certain locations, and then all the variable accesses, depending upon where these identifiers were, we were going to find out exact locations from where we could pick up all this information. Basically, all the addressing mode information will come here, and then we want to map all the source operators to <coughs> the target operators, and if there is no equivalent target operator, then we want to write some kind of macro for that, and then we want to convert all the conditions and iterations into a sequence of tests and jumps. Right? And after that, we started looking at the parameter passing protocols, and this is where at least some discussion is required. So what we want to do in parameter passing is that we want to find out where are we going to put all the arguments, and we want to find out where we are going to pick up the return values from. Okay? So typically what may happen is that if I say call some function p with a list of actual arguments, okay, what is going to happen? That somewhere in my machine I will have to say what is the place where the arguments are going to be. And I also want to find out the place where I am going to put the return value. Okay. Now I cannot put all this information at some arbitrary place. I need to put it at some fixed place and therefore we must have certain <coughs> protocol which will say that where the parameter passing, how I am going to do parameter passing, where I am going to put all this information, what is going to be the layout of this procedure, where I am going to put activation frames and so on. Okay. So I must lay out the complete activation frame of the function. And when we do runtime system and we talk about code generation and talk about the code generation for procedures and function, that time the layout of activation frame will become clear to you. Okay. And then we also must have some kind of interface to all the libraries which we may have. So we may have mathematical libraries, we may have statistical libraries and so on. We may have called to runtime system, operating system and so on. So we must know how to make these. <coughs> so compiler we have to find out appropriate mapping. Right? Everyone is in sync with this? Okay. So once we do this, okay, then like we had this compiler structure to begin with, we said we are going to have front-end phases. After front-end phases, we had certain optimization, and then we started talking about code generation phases. Okay. We can also do a little bit of optimization after code generation. Okay. So some optimization we were trying to do was, we were trying to remove all kind of redundancies which are present in the program, but some redundancies do come because of the code generation phase. So when I'm trying to do code generation, certain more redundancies will creep in and I would like to remove them and what kind of redundancies these may be. So I may generate information like saying multiply something by uh, by one or multiply by zero. Okay? And typically this kind of information will get generated when I'm trying to do code generation for either arrays or for structures and records. Okay? And that point of time, if some such information gets generated, you would like to just remove them by doing a post code generation optimization. Okay. And we also try to use commutative properties of the operators we have. So for example, if I have an expression like this versus an expression like this, where I say x is sign x plus y or x is sign y plus x. Okay. Now you will see that try to use any C compiler and generate code for this. 
by switching off all the optimizations and you will find that the two code sequences are going to be different. And what could be reason for that? Why these code sequences may be different? <coughs> so normally, my compiler is going to scan input from left to right. Okay? And then it will be able to figure out that the first argument is same as the left hand side. And therefore, once I evaluate the second argument or the remaining arguments, I will just pick up that value and add it to location where x was already stored. Okay? But when I am scanning this, it will first encounter y, then it will encounter x. Okay? Now, x may be somewhere in the middle, anywhere. Okay? So, I could be even of this form. And therefore, it will start loading this, start loading this, we will add the two and so on. Okay? So, normally what we will try to do is, this is the best possible way and in fact, C already uses a very concise notation for this and they have introduced in operator like Right? So, the whole idea of writing a sequence like this is that I can generate <coughs> better code. So, now I am going to actually what I am doing here is I am using certain properties of algebra here saying that x plus y is same as y plus x in most cases <coughs> unless I am doing high precision numerical analysis. Okay? So, this is really that is why I put this question mark that sometimes when you are trying to do high precision numerical analysis then if you try to use computative properties, it is possible that you will end up getting different results and such optimizations should not be done. Okay? And then I will start actually using instruction selection. So, once I have done the intermediate code generation, then I will look at the complete syntax of the machine and we try to find out how do I use the syntax of the machine for finding out addressing mode, op code and the default optimization and so on. And once that is done, okay, what will happen? So this is where we were at the end of the front end. Okay, so I'm I have the same example running through. This is the disintegrated abstract syntax tree we had at the end of the front end. And now what happens is when I try to do intermediate code generation, okay, it generates a code like this, which is not with respect to any machine, which is not tied to a particular machine, but is close to many machines. So I may have something like this, which may say that this variable p is actually stored at an offset of a with respect to certain frame pointer. This is a constant 0 and when I add a with the value in the frame pointer, what does it give me? It gives me address of where b is stored, but I need the value of p. So, I do a dereference here, I do a memory dereference and that gives me the value. Okay? I add the 2 and similarly on the right hand side when I look at a and a, a is stored at an offset of 4 from some frame pointer, B is stored again at a frame pointer with an offset of 8. I add the addresses, dereference and then add the 2. Okay. Um, there is, uh, oh this is an assignment. Okay, So, this is where the move takes place. So, I am just taking this value moving into this address and then I am using an if statement here which is equal to a conditional jump and so on. Okay. So, there is a kind of intermediate tree I will get and when I do an optimization, now optimizer may say that I am going to put all these values in a register and not into memory location. Okay? So, I may have registers like saying that this will occur in, so B will be in register Cx and A will be in register Dx okay? and therefore, some optimization happens here. I do not have to do all this memory dereferencing. And then finally, I may end up generating code like this. It just says compare Cx with 0 and move on 0 Cx to Dx. If it is 0, then just move it. Okay. So, starting from whatever I started with, <coughs> some expression, if expression, I may finally generate code like this after going through many transformations on the code. Okay. Now, you can see that all I have done is that I have changed the representation from whatever I started with, but I am actually employing the same algorithm, I am not changing anything. Okay. So, how does my compiler look now? This is where we left our compiler with the front end okay, and we left this, this part of the block empty and if I now try to fill it in, we will have an optimizer which is an optional phase and then we will have two phases of code generation. One is intermediate language code generation and then we have the code generation and this also is historically or traditionally known as the backend phase which is specific to the machine. So, this is where the machine 
specific information starts coming into compile. And this really completes your overall structure of the compiler. Questions, comments, anything? So right now what we have no clue of what happens really here or how lexical analyzer works, how syntax analyzer works and so on. Okay? But we have some idea of that if I take a representation here and I apply these phases, then what will be the representations here and what will be my final representation. Right? At least that part is sort of clear to everyone. So let's move on. Okay? And what may happen now is that there is some information which is lacking here. Okay? So for example, when I looked at something like this, okay? so let's just take a piece of code. So if I say A is sine B plus C, okay? this is for which I am trying to generate code. When I start converting this into a lexical analyzer, okay, what will be the sequence of tokens which is generated by the lexical analyzer, which will be fed to the syntax analyzer? Oh, where is A? So this is my input, right? So what is the sequence? So if this is my input, this is the sequence of characters I have which I feed to my compiler, what will be the outcome of lexical analyzer? So what is it that I will see here? What will be my token? <coughs> okay. Doesn't matter what the types are, right? Do I need to know types to find out what my tokens are? So I don't need to know the types. We need to define them. We need to define them. That will be declared up somewhere up in the program, right? So I am only looking at this part of the program and say, tokenize this. What will I get as token? <laughs> one by one, somebody can raise the hand and then I can. To 50 of you start speaking, I won't be able to figure out anything. Yeah. Where A operator equal, where B operator plus, where C. Is that what it will be? Yes, and some white spaces. <coughs> and some white spaces. And some white spaces, but white spaces do not contribute anything to the mean, right? right. So I, I can ignore white spaces, I don't have to worry about the white spaces. Okay. But really, this is not what happens. Now, what happens is, I will say that these are all identifiers. Okay? Now, as far as structure is concerned, as far as syntax analyzer is concerned, to check structure whether this is a valid expression or not, whether this is a valid assignment or not, it need not know anything about what the variables are. Right? All it needs to know is whether this is an identifier or not. So what I would like to pass on is, I will say, identifier assign identifier some class of <coughs> operator which is addition operator and again an identifier. Okay. Now as far as my syntax analyzer is concerned, this information is sufficient to do structural analysis. Okay. When it comes to type checking, at that point of time, it will need to know what is the type which is associated with this identifier, what is the type which is associated with this, what is the type with this and what this exact operator is. This is what my semantic analyzer will do. When I come to code generation and I say, now assign certain memory locations to this, that time it will say, oh, this particular variable is put into certain memory location. So I'll say that this was in an offset of 8, this was in offset of, so let's say this was 4, this was 8, and this was 12. Okay? So this is a lot of information. If I look at this identifier, there's a lot of information which is associated with this identifier. One information is really the string, which is this string, okay, which I need to know that the string associated with this identifier is different than this. Okay? I also need to know the type. I also need to know the offset and maybe some other information like 
with type I will also get by default information saying how many bytes it is going to take when I store it in memory. Right? Now where do I store all this information? If this is the sequence of tokens I am passing, I cannot <coughs> afford to lose this information. I need it at time of code generation. So where do I store this information? I need to store it somewhere. Okay? And for that what we have is that information which is required about the program variables during compilation. So I may have various kind of information, with whether this is a keyword, this is an identifier, <coughs> what is the class, what is the type, amount of storage it requires, address in memory, and so on. This I need to store somewhere. And location for this information is, either it can be right here. So I can define this as a structure. And I say that all this information is right here. But then you can see I get into obvious problems. And what are obvious problems? That suppose I change this to A, what will happen? This information will get duplicated. If I change anything, I need to go and find out all these places where this information was and change them. Okay? Or I can say that I have something called a symbol table. And I can say all the information corresponding to A is here. And then all these are pointing to A here. Okay? So if I now create another data structure where information about all these are going to be stored. This is where we'll store it, and this is a data set <coughs> or symbol table. At this point of time, we'll not worry, worry about what actual data structure I employ. You can just assume this is an array of records to begin with, okay? where each record is going to have information about each of the symbols I have in my program. Okay? So how will my compiler look now? That along with this phases of compiler, I must have a symbol table where the symbol table can interact with all the phases. Okay? So what each phase will do? Lexical analyzer will not have type information, for example. It will just say what is the lexeme which is associated with the variable. So only thing lexical analyzer will know is this identifier has a lexeme associated with this, which is A. Right? When it comes to type checker, type checker will figure out what is the type of it and will put this information. When it comes to code generation or memory allocation, memory allocator will say if type of this is floating point, I need to allocate 8 bytes for this. And memory allocator will immediately say that since you require 8 bytes for this, let me assign certain address to this and it will give me the base address. When it comes to code generation, code generator will again figure out where I need to put this information and I may need to associate certain registers with this. Okay? So all that information will keep going in the symbol table and therefore you see a bi-directional arrows here that all these phases will be able to write into the symbol table and will be able to read from the symbol. So this is additional information I need in addition to the flow of data in my compiler. Yes? Sir, can you explain why writing in the table? Why? Writing in the symbol table is required. Oh, so if I start reading this from left to right, okay, I encounter A first and lexical analyzer figures out that this is an identifier. Okay? Now, where do I store string A? This A has to be stored somewhere. Where do I store it? In the symbol table. So if I cannot write into the symbol table, how will I store it? Okay. Similarly, when I come to this phase, which is semantic analyzer phase, and this figures out that type of A is integer, where do I store this information? I need to write it to the symbol table. Okay. Similarly, when it comes to memory allocator, memory allocator says that I'm going to assign this variable at an offset of 16 from some train pointer. Where do I store this information 16? I need to go back to my symbol table. Okay? So I need to be able to write and I should be able to read from the symbol table. Okay? So not all the information will be written by all the phases. Each phase is going to write some information which is relevant to that particular phase. The question answered? Okay. Now, so here is a model of compilation we have. Okay? And interestingly, as I pointed out when we were talking about history of compilers, that this was the model which was used exactly as in 1957 compiler, which was the first 421 compiler. Okay? That structure has not changed in the last 55 years. Okay? Now, what are the advantages? There must be certain advantages, otherwise, if you would have change all this structure by now. Right? So what are the advantages of this structure? And what are the disadvantages of this structure? 
code of compiler or code? Complete, complete compiler. So, code will be modular. Good. Okay. So, basically, one advantage we clearly see here is that each phase is doing something <coughs> which is a logical activity which is complete in itself. Okay. So, like lexical analyzer is just tokenizing my input. Right. My syntax analyzer is just checking structure. My type checker is just checking the types and nothing else. Okay. So, you can see that you have highly <coughs> modular code where each phase is doing something which is a coherent logical activity. That is really the good part of this. What are the other advantages you can think of? Other than the modular. Other than the? Modular. Yeah, I mean modular we have already listed. So, other advantages. We would have to write the front end part for different machines. Uh, different machines or different languages? Different machines. Uh, can you elaborate on that? The same front end part can be used for a, a liner system or So, if I have one language and I have multiple machines, then the same front end can be used. Very good. And we should be able, able to apply to the back end that if I have many languages and one machine, then I should be able to use the same back end. Right? Science, law, science like a very nice property that we have been able to employ. So, these are the advantages. Also, this is known as analysis synthesis model <coughs> compilation. Where front end phases are known really the analysis phase. What front end is doing is basically taking an input, analyzing it to find out whether this is a valid input with respect to the language definition or not. And what is my back end doing? It's synthesizing a program, which is a machine program for some correct input. Okay? And each phase has a well defined work, and each phase ha also handles a logical activity in the process of compilation. Okay? Now you can see that I can just take this phase do something with it and in the process of debugging if I find that certain information is not correct then very precisely I know where to go back and start looking for possible bugs. I do not have to really look at the whole compiler. I just need to focus on part of it. Okay? Continuing on this okay, and this is really what some of you already <coughs> pointed out that I can use part of the front end, part of the back end and the whole compiler becomes retargetable. So, suppose I am trying to write a C compiler for a new machine. I do not have to rewrite the front end. I will pick up the front end as it is and will change that. And my compiler gets retargeted to a new machine. Okay. Similarly, if I have compiler for a machine and I say a new language has been designed, then I just need to write a front end for this and then I can work with the back end which is already available. So, source and machine independent code optimization is also possible because if you see optimization what I had, okay, that was independent of both source specification and the target machine that was working on certain intermediate representation. And therefore, another advantage is that I do not have to plug in an optimizer to begin with. I can have a full compiler, a working compiler and then at some point of time I can say here is now an optimizer which I am going to plug in and suddenly your code quality improves. The same compiler will continue to work. That is another advantage. Right. So, highly modular structure and optimization phase can be inserted after the both front end and back end have been developed. And this is actually a clean model and this is how people do it in industry that you first have a functional compiler which will assure <coughs> a functional correctness and then go for an optimizer which you are going to plug in at some later point of time. Okay. Now, what are the various issues which you need to be alert about? when we start designing a compiler. So, what are the various issues we need to face? Okay. <coughs> Structure looks fairly straightforward so far, okay. but as we start going deeper into it, then you will start noticing the kind of problems we face. Now, when I take each phase specifically, we will discuss the <coughs> problems here of each phase. So, I will talk about what are the pitfalls you may notice in a lexical analyzer, what are the problems you may notice in a syntax analyzer and so on. Okay. But in general, Okay. We need to worry about, for example, suppose your input is incorrect. Okay. How do you handle incorrect input? <coughs> now, when I say input is incorrect, what does that mean? It is not that you have a buggy program. The program could be buggy, it could have logical errors. But what I am worried about is that with respect to the language specifications, whether your input is correct or not. Because compiler is, has no way of figuring out whether they are logical errors or not. Right? So, now you have to worry about incorrect programs, you need to do 
what we know as error reporting and error recovery. Okay? Now, as your languages become more and more complex, and as your architectures become more and more complex, your compiler, <coughs> it's going to have an impact on the compiler. I'll not say whether it becomes simpler or more complex. So for example, if I want to write compiler for programming language C versus a compiler for a programming language like C++, okay, the two are going to be very different. The reason is that if I'm trying to design a C++ front end, then I have to do so many things in my syntax analyzer and type checker okay, that it could be virtually hell. Okay. And then there are languages which are even worse than that. So if you try to go and Google for a language called Chill or language called Ada, then suddenly you will find that they are much worse. Okay. Much worse in the sense that let me not use the word worse. I mean that sounds very negative. Okay. They are more complicated. And obviously, some of you bright guys are going to handle these as your input in your projects. Okay. Some of you will be able to, <coughs> not all of you will get to, get to write a C compiler. Okay. Some of you who are brave hearts, they will pick up languages like Ada and Chill to write compilers. Okay. So, design of programming languages and architectures are going to have a big <coughs> impact on complexity of the compiler. Okay. And then, this immediately brings us to this issue of retargeting compilers. So typically what may happen is, or what is desired, is that whenever there is a machine and whenever there is a programming language, I must have a compiler for a programming language for that machine, right? And if you say that there may be 10 to 15 popular architectures and maybe 20 popular languages, then I need about 200 compilers, okay? Somebody will have to sit and code them, okay? Now, this is what is also known as classical m cross n versus m plus n problem. Okay? So what we are trying to do is we are trying to find out whether there is a situation. So some, but some of you really talked about saying front end and back end. Okay? Now if I use that situation, what is the most critical part? So if here if I say I have these front ends okay? and I have these fn front ends and I have back ends which are let's say going from B1 to Bn. Okay, so I have these front ends and I have back ends. Okay. Now to connect to them, okay, I need something. Okay, and what is that something I need? I just cannot arbitrarily say that pick up this front end and pick up this back end and give me a compiler, right? There's an intermediate language there. Okay, so what you're talking about is some intermediate language, and this can also be called as a switch box, okay, where you say that all front ends will be able to generate same intermediate language and all backends will be able to work with the same intermediate language as right? So what I need now are just n frontends and n backends, right? So instead of having n cross n compilers, I can just write uh, n frontends and n backends, so n plus n and then life is simple. But life is simple so long as I can design a universal intermediate representation. So, because there is always a trade-off, right? The trade-off here is that I should be able to design this switch box now. Now, is that straightforward? Now, suppose you have imperative language, okay? you have logical languages here, logic programming languages, you have functional languages, all kind of complex languages may be there. And you are saying that I should be able to translate everything into a single intermediate representation. So, is that reasonable? Is that realistic? No, then all this structure goes for a toss, right? So what we are talking about, I can employ a front end and a back end and so on. Okay, that will not work. So what do I do? Okay. So typically this is how my n cross n compilers will look, and this is how my universal intermediate representation with all these front ends and back ends will look. Okay. And prerequisite for this is that I must have a universal intermediate language. What properties this universal intermediate representation must have that it should work for all languages and all possible machines? And there doesn't seem to be much commonality between this large set of languages and large set of machines. 
So interestingly, this project started way back because people realized this problem way back when the first compiler was written in 1958 itself. People started talking about it. Okay? So because at that point of time itself, people were saying that look, I mean, IBM has one machine, but other machines were getting developed, and at least two, three other programming languages were quickly coming up. So COBOL was there. People were talking about Algol and some other languages were there. So this idea of a linguistic switch box actually materialized within an year of the first compiler. Okay. And the idea was that if I can come up with some kind of compiler, so that time it was called compiler-oriented language, universal computer language, and so on. People gave various names to this acronym. Computer scientists are very good in inventing these kind of terms very quickly. Okay. But the whole idea was that I want some kind of linguistic, linguistic switch box, okay, which will be able to then do this translation. Okay. And was supposed to have certain properties and basically idea was to reduce the total development effort of compilers for different languages to mapping onto different architectures. Okay? And it did not succeed. Okay? So the whole effort, yeah, I mean first one proposal was made in 61 to reduce this development effort. Yet another was made, okay, I mean people were talking about and another effort was made. And what happened was that it is next to impossible to design a single intermediate representation. So if we don't succeed here, do I go back to this model where I say forget about this box and have n cross n compilers? No, very good. If no, then what is the solution? Sir, all the languages are different. There are different types of languages, but they share some similarities between. So there, there can be a group of languages which share some similarity. So we can uh, design a uh, intermediate language for those uh, similar languages. Very good. So really this is, this was the solution which was proposed saying don't look for a general solution but look for a solution that will work for a subset of languages and for a subset of machines. Okay? And this was the idea which was proposed and rather than saying that, uh, so there are many, many uh, literature part I have given here which you can read some point of time. Okay? But the idea was interesting saying don't look for a universal intermediate representation, but find out languages which are similar and find out machines which are similar and design now an intermediate representation which will work for this set of machines. So I may not have a solution for this n plus n problem, but I have this solution for a subset of machines and a subset of languages. And this is what was proposed. Okay? So common IR for similar languages and similar machines have been designed. So if you look at GCC, for example, GCC will find ports onto many machines, it can compile many languages and it has a common intermediate representation. And in industry also, when we use many of the compilers, okay, they use a common intermediate representation for a set of languages and a set of machines. Okay. And that really is a working solution. Okay. Now another important quick question, an important issue that we have to face is how do we know that the code which has been generated is correct. And we already saw that there is no way I can prove that my compiler is correct. Okay. Now, let's, let's understand the scenario. Let's visualize the scenario. Okay. Uh, when you started working maybe in first year ESC 101, okay, and which was the first language you used? C or Java? C. <coughs> and when you compiled your C program and it did not work, what was your first reaction? Hmm. Check the errors and redo. Check? Check the errors and redo the program. Uh, redo the program, right? Okay. Anyone else tried something else? Recompile. Recompile. But recompile, if you could recompile the same program, nothing gets changed, right? <laughs> so if a program is not working and you recompile, it's the same behavior is replicated. Nothing changes there. <laughs> compile with a? Different compiler, but when you are sitting on that desk, I mean, sitting on that computer, and you say, "What different compiler you have?" So you were you start a debugging program. Now tell me one thing. I mean, this was a program you wrote, but you did not have confidence in this program. You were saying my program is incorrect. I need to debug it. Did you ever blame the compiler, saying my program is correct? I don't know who has written this compiler. <laughs> it has generated the wrong code, and therefore my program is not working. Did you ever blame the compiler? What? 
That means you have this confidence in compiler that whatever compiler is doing it is correct. What I am doing is perhaps buggy, and therefore I need to check my program. Okay? That means somebody must have done a good job of testing the compiler, a good job of convincing you that don't blame the compiler, look at your program. So how do you generate this level of confidence in your program? Compiler is yet another program, right? So can you generate similar level of confidence in your own program? And if yes, how do you do it? I can tell you, I mean, our instructor, when you are doing this course, like equivalent of ESC 101, so when he wrote the program, uh, our instructor was Professor Sars Budde. So the professor, he will come to the lab and say, so are you confident that your program is correct? Yes, okay, run it. Run it, it will take some input. And how do you give input? He just put his hand on the keyboard, okay? And most of the time, your program is going to crash because some random input will go. So if you are saying read in PGR and if your input is not in PGR, what happens? Code up. Okay. You are taking some input, but you are not checking whether this input should always be in PGR. What happens if I give a character input? You straight away go, go for code up. Now that is not how real programs work. Right? If you give incorrect input to compiler, have you ever seen code up in a compiler? It gives you a nice error message. Right? So really compiler goes through a lot of testing and one way is obviously prove that it is correct, but that is something you cannot do. So program proving techniques do not exist at the level of where compilers can be shown to be correct. Okay. So what we need to do is, we need to do a very systematic way of finding out or systematic testing, which is going to increase our confidence level. Okay. And what is normally done is, we have something known as test suite for the programming language. This test suite is independently designed by language designers. This is not part of the compiler. Okay? So what happens is that I have a language, I have a language specification, and I have a test suite which is going to test any compiler which is going to be written for this language. Okay? And what does this test suite contain? This test suite contains thousands of programs. Okay? Sometimes it can run into tens of thousands of programs. And each program is going to test a specific feature of the language. <coughs> and we'll have a documented behavior saying, if this is my input, this is this should be the output of the program. And it will also have buggy programs, which will say, if this is my input, okay, this is the kind of error message compiler should give. Because compiler should not be generating code for incorrect programs. Okay? It should be able to test both for correct input and incorrect input. Okay? So we have a test suite. And what happens is that you have a test suite of program where you have expected behavior of each of the programs, which is documented. And this test suite is given to the compiler right? saying, test your compiler against this suite. Okay? And all the test programs must be compiled using the compiler. And all deviations must be reported back to the compiler writer. And normally, this is not done by compiler writer themselves. This is done by quality assurance team. Okay? And there is a classical sort of observation in industry that you cannot find bugs in your own program. You sort of trust it all the time. So it is someone else's job, really. QA team is always a different team, which will say, I'm going to just dissect it and find as many bugs as possible. And they use these test suites. So test suites are shared by this. Now, how do I go through this testing? Okay. Suppose I give you 50,000 programs. I give you a test suite which contains 50,000 programs. And you start testing it. Okay. Now what happens? You start test. So suddenly you find that. 5,999 programs are working correctly. You come to 6,000 programs, and it crashes. It gives me an error that your compiler now has a bug. What do you do in such a situation? You have to debug your compiler, right? Now, when you debug your compiler, probability that you have removed that bug, which was not compiling 6,000 program, or program number 6,000, is gone. It will now compile. but what guarantee do you have that the other programs which you already tested, they will now compile? No guarantee. Right? In fact, I mean the classical again situation is every time you remove a bug, perhaps you introduce two more. And that is what you will notice in the last week of April when you start <coughs> checking your project code in the week of 15th. Everyone will come for demo. Sir, abhi tak kaam kar tha, abhi abhi crash ho gaya. Abhi nahi chan. Because I was trying to remove some bug, it was working fine, but now it doesn't work anymore. Okay. This is half the teams will give me this reason in that week particular, and you will notice it now. Okay. 
So what you have to do therefore is whenever you are trying to remove bulk, okay, you have to go through something known as regression testing. And what is this regression testing? That whenever you find that there is a bug, your program does not work, you fix that and start from the beginning. Okay? And go all over once again. Till you have compiled all the programs in the test suite in a single go, with a single version of the compiler, and have observed whatever is the correct behavior, whatever is the documented behavior of that particular program in the test suite. Okay? So this is also known as regression testing that you keep on doing it again and again till no program has or till your compiler for all the programs in the test suite gives me the documented result. Okay? And how do we design test suite? Uh, okay. So how do we design test suites? Okay. So we want to make sure that we do not have repetitive programs. For example, another thing you will notice that when you start doing your project, you will write a program and if I ask you how many programs did you use to test your compiler? There's five programs. Okay, good. So show me these five programs. Every program has a for loop with different values. Okay. So one will be for going i going from one to ten. Another will be for i going from ten to fifty. Now these two programs do not give me new information. They are just repetition. They are more of the same. Okay. So you have to make sure that the test programs you have, they are going to exercise different parts of the compiler. Okay. So you have to do some amount of coverage analysis. You have to make sure that most of your features of the compiler, most of the language constructs of your compiler are exercised during the testing of this testing process. Okay? And therefore, test program should exercise every statement of compiler at least once. And usually, it is an art really. I mean, the people who design test suits, okay? they, are, they are experts in that. Okay? And they are exhaustive test suits which have been constructed for some languages, like Ada has an exhaustive test suit. And if you notice, Ada is perhaps the only language which has a registered trademark or TM on top of that, which is a language of Department of Defense. And they are the ones who have designed the test suite. And you say, any Ada compiler in this world, if you want to be called it Ada compiler, must be tested by Department of Defense US. Otherwise, it is not going to be called an Ada compiler. Okay? So this kind of exhaustive test suits do exist. Okay? And people have used them to really test their compiler. Okay, so this is this is how you generate a lot of confidence into the compiler. Okay, so now how do we reduce all this effort? Okay? All the time, what we are trying to do is we are trying to do things efficiently. Right? So we are saying we have to write a compiler, we have to test it, okay? we have to do various things, and all the time I am trying to reduce this development and testing effort because I want to cut down on time, okay? and I want to cut down on cost. So how do I do it? So one simple solution is, let's not write compilers. <laughs> we don't write compilers, we don't have to do projects, we don't have to worry about one third of the credit, life will be simple. But that's really not the solution, that's an extreme position. Okay. Now if we don't write compilers, what do I do? I still need compilers. Right? <coughs> Somebody has to write them. Okay. So you get a compiler writer. Okay. And what we say is, let's not worry about writing compilers. <coughs> we'll somehow have a black box. Now imagine a situation here is a black box. And I tell this black box, I have two ports here <coughs> and one port on this side. I say Pascal, Motorola, and what comes out is a compiler, Pascal compiler for Motorola machine. That would be great, right? <laughs> I just put in two USB sticks here. One has language specifications, one has machine specifications, and what comes out is a compiler. Yes, no. So can we think of black box like this? You have already seen these black boxes. You seen code generators somewhere? Have you used code generators? Yes, no. Okay, so let's go back. CS251. What are the things you did in CS251? You have done this for CS251? Three fifty five. You have done CS three five five. Okay. So what are the modules we did in CS three five five? Anyone who remembers CS three five five and the modules in CS three five five? Relax, yeah, and later and okay. 
Somebody who remembers about Lex? Anyone from this side who remembers about Lex? What was Lex? What is the full form of Lex? Have you read the manual? Do you remember reading the manual of Lex? So what was the title of the manual? Highly bullet. <coughs> Lex, a lexical analyzer generator. And Yak was yet another compiler compiler. Right? Okay. So what we were really doing was a compiler should a compiler generator should be able to generate compiler. Okay? And you have seen simpler versions of this. What did Lex do? What was input to Lex? <coughs> what was input to Lex? Yeah, you want to say? Don't you remember? A set of regular expressions, right? Specification. And what was the output? C code. Okay? A file called lex.yy.c. Okay? And then you just compile it using some name. Right? So similarly, I can think of now a compiler generator which will take language specifications, which will take target machine specifications, and will give me a compiler. If I can create this box, okay, then I don't have to write compilers. Okay. So I can shift whole effort from writing compilers to writing a compiler generator and then if I can somehow write these specifications, then all I need to do is whenever I get a new language, write those language specifications, whenever I get a new machine, write those machine specifications and generate a compiler. Quick job, right? Very quickly I can generate compilers. Okay. Again, this looks like too tough a thing to do, like we said writing a full compiler and then taking it through various phases. Okay? I may not get to do it in a single step, I may want to do it in multiple steps. Similarly, I want to do this activity also into multiple steps and saying that I have language specifications. When we say that we have specifications of source and target, but if I look at source specifications, <laughs> what were the specifications I started looking at? When I was compiling languages, I said I must have a set of alphabets then I must know how to tokenize, then I must know how to check the structure, I must know how to check the meaning and so on. Okay? So language specification could be given at several levels of abstraction. Okay? So various abstractions work into things like lexeme, structure, semantics, etc. And for each component, I can write separate specifications. So when I talk of language specifications, I can write, I can say that when I say something is an identifier, I can use specifications in English which says it is a string of characters that, ha that has at least one alphabet, starts with one alphabet, and starts with an alphabet followed by alphanumerics. And they are concise languages where if you recall your regular expressions, I can write something like this. I can say it is a letter followed by letter or digit, zero or more occurrences of this. I'm using Cleanish flow here, right? And if you say you may have underscore or dollar sign and so on, you can again just make changes to this. Now when I'm saying I want to write a lexical analyzer, this is the only input I should give. I should not worry about more than saying that I use certain data structures, I read my input and so on. Okay? Those are mundane tasks I have to do every time. Only my specifications take. Okay? So therefore, I can similarly write syntax and semantic descriptions and then I can also write target machine specifications. Okay? We'll see how to write these specifications. And then I can go back to my compiler and say, if I want to write lexical analyzer, don't worry about writing lexical analyzer, but use a situation, use a tool which is lexical analyzer generator, which you have already seen is a lex, and all I need to do is give specifications of the lexemes. Okay? And this is what my regular expressions were. Right? Similarly, <coughs> I can have a parser generator. So instead of writing a parser, I can have a parser generator and I can write my specifications which are parser specifications. I can write my specifications in terms of context-free grammar. And what is the outcome? This is what Yak gave me, right? I wrote my context-free grammar specifications and what came out was C code, which was nothing but a parser, okay? So similarly, I can think about other phases and I can have tools for each of the phases and I can have specifications for each of the phases, okay? I can have specifications for code generator so I can have code generator generator and I can have machine specifications, right? And
and what is the outcome now? I am not writing these phases, but I am using these tools and I am writing specifications all the time. Now, will it make life simpler? Definitely, as compared to this, the overall effort here will be reduced. How much reduced? Okay. So normally, we say that if I am using certain tools for code generation, in compilers we have seen, overall effort can go down by almost two thirds. Okay. So it's not that I can do it in one day because writing specification and writing tool is time consuming. But if I had total X effort X in writing a compiler, by using the tools and using the specification, I can do it in about 0.65x, which is a lot of reduction. Okay? I mean, you are saying 35% effort will be gone. And then, not just that effort in coding is gone, but your testing becomes easier. Because now, when you say that I want to debug my lexical analyzer, I just need to debug this. I need to say that whether my specification is correct or not. I don't have to worry about data structures. I don't have to worry about looping. I don't have to worry about whether I was reading my input correctly or not. That is one thing we have noticed generates maximum number of errors. You are reading your input, you either skip a character or read extra characters and suddenly you find that something cannot be tokenized. Okay? Your data structures are not correct. All those errors will be gone. They will be part of my tool which I need to test only once again. Okay? And this also has certain more advantages because suddenly you find that this is not very efficient because tool is not generating good code. All I need to do is make this efficient. So if you see flex, and you remember Lex, what is Flex? Fast Lex. Suddenly you found that Lex was not giving me very good performance, so we wrote Flex, and then you generate the same code, same specification, and you generate much efficient code for the same specification, and you have a more efficient code. Okay? So each of these phases can be made more efficient just by improving quality of the tools. Right? So then the kind of effort we are going to put in into writing compiler will not look at the code which goes in here, but our effort is going to be that what are these tools and how do I write specifications. This is where the focus of this course is going to be. Right? So how do we retarget compiler? All I need to do is change machine specifications, change language specifications, and our new compiler. Right? So if I need to modify a phase, I just need to change specifications here and tool based development can cut down your time by almost 30 to 40 percent. Okay? And this is tool testing is only one time of okay? And performance can be improved by improving the tool itself. Okay? And this is the last point as far as this introduction is concerned. How do compilers of 21st century look? We are talking about the first compiler of 1957 versus compilers of 2013. Okay? We said overall structure is same, but what about the effort? Okay? Overall structure is still the same, but effort is now in back end because a lot of optimizations happen. There are different kind of machines. So you talk about all these multi-core machines, you talk about GPUs, and various <coughs> kind of other machines were coming which were not present in that era. Okay? So most of the effort has really shifted into the back end, and your runtime system, code generation, code optimization has become much more complicated than what it used to be 50 years back. But front end is now much simpler because they are very standard tools. They are good mathematical models for handling the front ends like backward languages and context free grammars and so on. Okay? So total effort has, proportion of effort has changed since early days of compilation. And earlier front end phases were more complex ones and the expensive parts. But today, back end phases are the one where more cost is involved and front end phases are not much simple. So this is where I close introduction and in next class we'll start on really the each of the phases of compiling. Which is a lexical